Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome back to Medical Physics for Life International Webinar. Today we are having the ninth webinar in the series. Today we are fortunate to have Dr. Arvind Rao, a proven leader in healthcare and distinguished medical physicist from India. He is the chairman and managing director of Kamalada Hospitals, Orissa, who completed his postdoctoral training in medical physics from Harvard Medical School, US, and the University of London, Sweden. He is known for his leadership in healthcare, along with other academic engagements. As his current area of interest is in artificial intelligence, he will be talking about the challenges on artificial intelligence on medical physics in the near future. I thank him for accepting our invitation to volunteer for today's lecture. As you know, the Medical Physics for Life campaign is to invoke awareness and to generate support for healthcare workers fighting the pandemic in the front line. If any of you wish to donate PPE for healthcare workers, please let us know by email, website, or social media. It may be one surgical mask or 1,000 of PPEs. It doesn't matter. So we will update all the details of the sponsors and donors in our website. Please feel free to use the question tab to type your questions as the microphones will be muted throughout this webinar. You can also type your questions during any time of the webinar. I thank Dr. A.B. Rath for volunteering this lecture irrespective of his busy schedule. Dear friends, please join me today in welcoming Dr. Rath on the stage by giving your full attention. Dr. Rath. Thank you, Dr. Sajeev. At the outset, I thank you for giving me an opportunity to be speaking to such an international audience all the way from the US to Australia. And actually the topic which uh, you are covering and we are trying to really address today, the topic of artificial intelligence, it's called a hot topic in our field right now. Uh, let me just, uh, begin by saying that this topic is something which has been gaining momentum in our community for the last uh, uh, few years. And uh, in the last year itself, I myself uh, had the opportunity of even presenting more than uh, a, a dozen talks. And actually the last time we physically met in uh, Mathura in the last week of uh, uh, February, where we had our and peace northern chapter meeting i had uh, talked on the same same topic and it is it gives me an um, opportunity to repeat many of the things which already many of the audience have already shared but then it is something uh, uh, it is important that at this juncture we continue uh, reinforcing our uh, uh, focus on this particular important topic um, is my sc screen visible completely Yes, yes, it's very much visible. Let me just begin with this saying that during this pandemic, it is important for us to keep moving. And I just begin with this uh, quote from Albert Einstein that life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And that's what we are doing in our field through our webinar, webinars. In the last uh, month, uh, the in the month of May, uh, the cover page of our medical physics journal from uh, uh, the AAPM, uh, which is actually an international journal which many of us uh, get access to, uh, is uh, uh, was dedicated on this particular topic of machine learning. The slide which I'm showing here is only to show that how contextual this particular uh, theme is in our uh, field, that actually the whole special issue was uh, dedicated on uh, uh, the machine learning. But then this interest had started a couple of years back, and as early as the June 2017, this topic was in the point counterpoint uh, 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 point, 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 uh, uh, list of the medical physics journal that machine learning will transform radiology significantly within the next five years. We have almost covered three years out of that 2017, and we are already in July 2020. And a significant jump definitely has happened 
and we are in the right direction and medical physicists have already, already been thinking in this line as a relevant topic for medical physics way back in 2017. And medical imaging continues to become, be the most important thing for medical physics because from our uh, for our radiation therapy planning, which actually many of almost 80 percent of our uh, medical physicists in the field are working in this area, are now utilizing medical imaging. So this is a merger which is happening, and uh, machine learning is actually something utilizing also the the existing big data that is available. Uh, in our field for the purpose of, of creating and optimizing these neural networks. Now the question is that we, even after that, in, in, in 2018, we had another uh, specific point counterpoint on that artificial intelligence will soon change the landscape of medical physics research and practice. This is something which many of our research colleagues also are spending a significant amount of their, their time in uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So there is a significant surge and many of uh, our people who are really our physicists who are working in uh, clinics should know that they also have to be creating the data in such a way that the researchers can use it for the purpose of medicine as well as to improve the overall healthcare. And that's where this particular talk is going to be focusing. The changing role of our medical physicists even though we will be continuing to be doing the many of the same things what we are doing right now but the impact of the medical physics research and practice changes that is going to come is something what we will be discussing and the expectations uh, uh, even though we, we believe that these expectations to be unrealistically high today but then the, the question now is that okay, what, where we need to be focusing is that okay, the technical validation of these expectations or these uh, the, the algorithms and the the language missing language uh, uh, activities that we, we take will be happening and even though it is looking like it is practically due to this its practical limitation it is not going to invade our field but we need to be cautious if we are not taking the right step now maybe we will miss the bus this is the uh, graph showing the frequency of the counts of the published uh, uh, medical physics uh, and the radiation uh, oncology literature in this field of machine learning and deep learning. Deep learning is something which is actually a subset of machine learning, which we will soon discuss. And this is only to show you the search of the uh, interest and the search of the publications in our field. Let us just be pause for a minute and see what is happening all over outside our field in this case of artificial intelligence. Actually, it is proposed or it is being already hyped that the future of mankind is artificial intelligence. On the other side, there are also some people who are very pessimistic and then they are talking that as if, as if artificial intelligence is going to be our final invention and the human race will get doomed because of this particular artificial intelligence itself, which is going to take over and even just before his death, Stephen Hawking had actually proposed something similar. And that's something which already is happening in many of the areas where we are experiencing today. We are having an invasion of the artificial intelligence activities, starting from our Apple Siri to the Google uh, Alexa to uh, all, the, all the way to, to our driverless cars, airports being managed by robots, and also the healthcare has already been taken over by the AI artificial intelligence through mobile uh, phones. As Stephen Covey tells that humans will be limited by the slow biological evolutions and hence artificial intelligence will take over when humans cannot compete and the machines will supersede us. Of course, this is a, a very high uh, negative prediction, but then these are all the two extremes what we are talking of. Somewhere in between right now we are there and that's why we have to be very practical that we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run, but underestimate the effect of the in, in the long run as was being as was being proposed or as is being quoted by Roy Amara and this is actually a graphical representation of his uh, above uh, theory and this law is called Amara's law and we are right now currently somewhere here, so we are still in the overestimate phase. And maybe very soon we will start touching the ground reality and then we will be able to see the, the, uh, the thing in a much more clearer perspective. Let's start with what is artificial intelligence. 
Computing Machinery and Intelligence in, in, in a seminal paper written by Alan Turing on the topic of artificial intelligence in the 1950s is actually it is considered as the first paper where he proposed that I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And Alan Turing was a World War uh, uh, technologist whose, whose, whose innovations made the Second World, uh, World War being won by the uh, Allied forces. And it was in the year 1956, the, coin, uh, the, the coining of the artificial intelligence term was done by McCarthy. Artificial intelligence is an area of computer science that emphasizes the creation of intelligent machines that work and react like humans. It's like humans. If we see the pyramid where the, the, the three stages of artificial intelligence is going to go, is right now what we are all looking into is the machine learning phase, and it will take us into a machine intelligence phase. And ultimately, we are going to see the machine consciousness or the cognitive self-reliant machines, where machines will totally take over many of the functions that what we are, we are, we are doing now. But of course, we're still at the bottom of the pyramid today, and we need to be, uh, uh, you be, be sure that the, the next two uh, stages are reached with the uh, end result of humans being benefited out of it. The modern data science, as, as it is being put, artificial intelligence is the big subset and under which we have a subset of, the, uh, of machine learning and deep learning is again a subset of machine learning. This, is, this slide only is being put to tell you that artificial intelligence is not the same as machine learning and machine learning is not the same as deep learning. These three are different, even though each one encompasses the, 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 the other. And as I told you, many of our present equipment, what we are talking are artificial intelligence and enabled. And machine learning is something actually the computer algorithms with the predictive abilities which are being designed. And deep learning is something which actually we use the data and to abstract the creation, abstract this, uh, this the data using those algorithms or those uh, models to extract those features just like you know whether it is a dog or a cat or whether it is a car or a, a bus these type of extractions are being done and that's where the deep learning comes in aids aid, aiding the deep learning uh, activities are the big data which is already available medical big data is something what is of our uh, interest but big data is available in a very big way in the industrial utilization which is basically leading the so, you know, the, the fourth uh, revolution, fourth industrial revolution, and actually the present existing mining of those uh, old data is called the data analytics that is being used for the purpose of creating those deep learning uh, facilities. To be very precisely defining deep learning, deep learning is a particular kind of machine learning that achieves the great power and the flexibility uh, by learning to represent the world as a nested hierarchy of concept, with each concept defined in relation to simpler concepts and more abstract representations computed in terms of less abstract ones. This is actually the pictorial or graphical representation where we can see machine learning is the one where we do the feature extractions in a manual manner, and then we, we use the classification utilizing those those procedures but when we merge these two in a computer and start utilizing the feature extraction and the classification unilaterally inside a system with those models which we have created we call that as deep learning and that's that's something which is actually is the is the area where we are really going to be utilizing many of our image analysis in the near future the concept of uh, uh, deep learning or the concept of uh, machine learning starts with uh, the same concept that you were talking about the neural networks as it works in our human brains it actually is a, a neuron is the place where we start really getting this the, the inputs and what, which actually results in an action that is called the output by the neuron so that is the way our brain functions and the same thing when we use it in the in the in the way of the neural networks a single layer of hidden uh, uh, instructions can give us to a simple neural network when these instructions 
are uh, hidden in many multiple layers, giving further instructions to each other. And finally, the input gets processed and comes out as an output. We call it as deep learning neural network or the multi-layered deep learning neural network. In this uh, COVID era, maybe a something similar COVID picture is something what I just thought I will show you, but this is nothing but defining machine learning in a much more uh, uh, organized manner that there are supervised learning and there are unsupervised learning. And also there is something called reinforcement learning in the machine learning arena. And the supervised learnings are basically task driven and the unsupervised learnings are basically data driven. And, and there is an intermediate uh, group where the reinforcement learning is happening learn to react to an environment. For example, if our skill acquisition and, and robots or the gamings are all through the reinforcement learning is the one where we use this machine learning tools. My aim is not to get deeper into the um, area of deep learning because that is not the primary area of focus for medical physics but this is just as an introduction to our field i was just trying to show you and these are some of the neural net, net networks the architectures has to be really also understood by us like like the convolution cnn networks or the rnn networks or the general uh, generative adversarial networks these are the ones which actually are rhetorically represented here i will go well much on it only to only for our younger colleagues who want to be getting going into the area of uh, machine learning for the medical applications these these are the architectures which they need to go and dive into and learn a little bit more let's come to our field what is artificial intelligence in medicine and why do we need artificial intelligence in medicine the ai in medicine is not a new concept because personalized medicine or precision medicine which all the way back in 2005 years back, back when it was different, it was defined, it was defined by Hippocrates as that different drugs to different patients for the sweet ones do not benefit everyone, nor do the stringent ones, nor are, are all the patients able to drink the same thing. And since those days, we have been trying to find for each patient and one type of treatment and when we found out that the DNA sequencing in the early 2000s, we thought that we have found out the personalized medicine. But very soon we realized that we need several other things other than just the, the, the DNA uh, information or the gen genetic genomic information. We need the pathology, toxicity, proteomics, imaging, blood and demographics. And all these things, when they are combined together and when we process this information, then only we are able to prescribe a treatment. And the more we, 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 we get into this, we find that we are supposed to be handling many more things together. And that's where this artificial intelligence is going to come handy to us, that we can process these all these informations together. And that's where the artificial intelligence is going to be utilized. There is no precision medicine without artificial intelligence. This is the medical futurist, and that's why we need to be, if we are talking about personalized medicine, which is going to be the future of medicine, we need to be going via the AI route to deliver this personalized medicine. Let me bring you the editorial of the European Federation of eForms white paper, which was published a couple of years back on the big data and deep learning in medical imaging in relation to medical physics profession. Because today we are talking about our profession's role in artificial intelligence. Let me just define it that big data and deep learning will profoundly change the various areas of profession, research, prof professional uh, professions and research in future. The change in, that will happen in medicine and medical imaging in particular is of importance to medical physics. As medical physicists, we should pursue beyond the concept of technical quality and extend our methodology and competence towards measuring and optimizing the diagnostic value in terms of how it is connected to care, the out to care outcomes. Functional implementation of such methodology requires data processing utilities, starting from data collection, data management, and culminating in the data analysis methods. Data quality control and validation are prerequisites. 
for the uh, deep learning applications in order to provide the reliable further analysis, classification, interpretation, and probabilistic predictive modeling for the vast heterogeneous big data. Challenges in practical data analytics relate to both horizontal and longitudinal analysis aspects. Quantitative aspects of data validation, quality control, physically meaningful measures, parameters, connections, and systems modeling for the future, artificial intelligence, in, and this, these prerequisites are actually quantitative aspects of data validation, quality control, physically meaningful measures, parameters, connections, and system of modeling for the future artificial intelligence methods are positioned firmly in the field of medical physics profession. This white papers, this abstract uh, uh, is something what I thought I, it, will, it makes it very clear that we are one of the profession which is very closely going to be very closely associated with the development of this particular field of artificial intelligence. And it is time that we do take this as an opportunity to do the necessary changes in our training and in our clinical activities so that we become a part and parcel of this change that is the global development is witnessing. Let's come back to our own core area where we always, in a day-to-day -day basis, we deal with is the images. Images are more than pictures, they are data. And this is what is the field, what we call it as radiomics. And this was in the year 2016 in the radiology, the review by um, our physics colleagues, uh, Gillis and uh, Kinan and, uh, and Dr. Uh, Hedwig had put it. Much before that, in the year 2012, a good paper had come from Philip Lambin and co on the omics of cancer, where how to use the radiomics for the purpose of uh, treating cancer. As we can see that the different sources of information like demography, pathology, toxicity, biomarkers, imaging, genomics and proteomics can be used for selecting the optimal treatment. So the information from all, the, all these sources are going to be collated and in particular, in case of imaging, the imaging and the multi levels of imaging, like anatomical, functional, and molecular imaging, all these inputs together will be uh, used for the purpose of treating cancer. But the truth lies that the anatomical imaging per se doesn't give us enough information so that we can cure cancer. Even after we added those physiological images of PET and the metabolic images of the PET CT we still do not have that answers. But today, with the more and more utilization of the genomics data, like the proteomics and the genomics, we need to be finding and waiting, and we need to be seeing that whether it is really going to be giving us an answer to cancer. But all these are possible when we are able to integrate all these things in one platform through these newer models, because it is physically not possible just with the, the human brain or the uh, retina eye to be really doing analysis of these all images for the purpose of uh, diagnosing and treating cancer. Going a little bit deeper on this molecular profiling, why this is a, such a big challenge is that there are 3 billion DNA coded letters in each human cell and 32,000 billion cells in the body. So each person has 96,000 billion uh, DNA coded letters. That's more than 10 times as many as the letters as uh, there are grains of sand in all the beaches of Earth. And an unlucky mutation in any one of these coded letters can initiate cancer to make it resistant to the drugs. That defines our challenge and also that defines our opportunity. So big data or the big gains for uh, big data leads to the big gains in cancer uh, research. And I just to show you that we need a lot of uh, data processing. Will the present level of computers be able to do that? No. The question is that what do we need? No, the present level of present computers will not be something what may not be maybe able to answer it. So the, it is just like as, the, as a light bulb is not a powerful candle, we may have to come up with completely different solutions or completely different avenues through which we need to find our solutions. For example, the present computers based on the digits zero and one, or the normal, in, in, in our physics language, we call it as, as classical computing, may need to be replaced with quantum computing, which is an, another emerging area. And many of our friends who, who did their uh, uh, physics in the, in, the, in, the, in the late 80s, 
and uh, um, the early 90s will go back to that the, the hot topics of quantum theoretical physics those days of course today uh, in physics it is again coming back and this is the, the decade the, two, the, the 2020 is the decade when we are celebrating the 100 years of quantum uh, mechanics and most of our um, uh, Nobel laureates who got uh, their uh, content for their contribution in the in the 1920s, uh, we are actually revisiting many of those areas. So it may be a, a good idea to go back and look into our quantum uh, mechanics principles like quantum entanglement, which we were so passionate during our post graduation days to be looked really looked into finding solutions for the uh, medical problems. Artificial intelligence in radiation oncology per se. Let me just redefine it that KHL, as I just told you that advances in many of the other domains which is called the fourth industrial revolution is forcing medicine to change and as a profession or as a specialty the, they are actually uh, seeing a lot of productive and destructive forces are happening and radiation oncology may not have already seen it but in medicine in areas like diagnostic radiology and pathology, such changes have already started happening because wherever the processing of the medical images or the complex interpretations are required, AI has already uh, uh, seeped into, or rather is trying to really take over the role of many of the uh, uh, radiologists' physical activities. Radiation oncology, it seems to be poised in that way, but the impact is still not that high, but then we cannot be lying uh, uh, behind or we cannot be relaxing because we need to be really creating the tools that will uh, really take this profession in the right direction medical physics as a specialty also will play a pivotal role in the in this evolution of radiation oncology in ai and the future of ai with will be will be will be definitely a, a, a shared environment where medical physicists role will change and medical physicists will play an important role in creating a more uh, uh, integrated environment of radiation oncology, which we have been doing in the last two decades, definitely. Artificial intelligence in radiation oncology, there are a lot of uh, papers. In the, this is a, a 2018 paper in the Green Journal, a speciality wide disruptive transformation. This is for the interest of our younger colleagues to so just to go through it. What are the areas it is being talking of? in the rec journal in the year 2018 this was very specifically told that the future of course future is a terminology which is very difficult to be uh, uh, you know if you are talking about future we may not be uh, predicting it uh, very easily but then we have to prepare ourselves for the future so this is what actually you know this will be ai will be transforming in a significant way the, that that will lead to a lot of automations and that's where it will reshape and the staffing levels will will, will keep changing and that's where the imaging also is something which is going to be really integrated and the power of power to transform the medical imaging data in radiation oncology will have to be led by the medical physicists now specifically in our uh, medical physics area the current state is that let us say that in the image segmentation inverse planning those optimization decision support quality assurance these are the areas as you can see here in google, google deep mind these are the uh, the 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 city Miradas and Angkorat medical crisis and radiation oncology platforms, these are already available. And then AI related research in the in this in, in present at present is something what we need to be using. I will not go into these uh, papers much detail, but I'm just giving it to you as an introduction that deep learning in medical imaging and and and, and you know this is something which was published in the, a couple of years back that how to get the, the region of interest mapped uh, from the earlier old data being brought in and utilizing the, the, the existing uh, new data that you are processing and that's where uh, the, 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 the the training set will occur and the, the, there has to be a separate set of data that will, that needs to be created for the test data and this is where actually this uh, this validation of this data is is something which needs to be done by the medical physics fraternity validation of the uh, the ai platforms is something where medical physicists will definitely play a, an important role and these knowledge based approaches like auto contouring is something which as i as we already seen that this needs to be really going through those training cohort where we really need to be really putting this this uh, this, this training activities has to be really monitored and done by the medical physicists 
I'll go. I'll give you a specific example that in last year in the Korean Journal of Radiology, this was a study which was published that 516 uh, artificial intelligence platforms or algorithms uh, were being uh, uh, artificial intelligence al algorithms that were already published were taken, and it was found out that only six percent of that. That means only 31 studies perform an external validation. So without these external validations, many of these eligibly published data may not be of any use because they're single institution data. And that's why it is very important for the, our medical physics community to realize that we do have to have a external validation system started. Maybe even one to two institutional external validation may not be also going to find the solution. But first, let it start. Let it at least happen with external validation. And that's why inter-institutional for the real world applications, as, I, as you can see here, this is when they took those uh, those data and started putting into a different platform through those uh, the, these model-based uh, uh, activities. They found out that you know the the, the one institution. With, the, with, the, with one model, this was the volume, and, and, the, and uh, this was the segmentation. And in another model, this was the same segmentation with the same technique. Whereas the manual one, which is, of course, I'm sorry about the, the color, actually the yellow colored one remaining the same, shows that there is a significant difference in the computer, computer segmentation with the two different models. That's why it is important that we do the independent data testing before any of these models are accepted. The potential future impact of AI on radiation treatment planning, as I've already told you that the largest and in the nearest term beneficiaries of advances of uh, artificial intelligence is going to be in radiation therapy treatment planning, both for creating the normal and the, uh, uh, the target volumes or the region of interest volumes in, the, in radiotherapy. Optimal modality and beam arrangements for among the range and maximize tumor control probability and minimize risk of, risk of toxicity. These are the ones which will be integrated into the treatment planning models uh, in the future. And integration of clinically relevant data from multiple sources will be done. Now, the potential future impact of AI on radiation treatment planning is simulation to initiation and online adaptive planning. Current critical skills such as contouring will take, take a passage we'll see their importance fade away. And that's why, especially for the younger colleagues in the radiation oncology, especially the clinicians who are really right now spending maximum of their time in these uh, activities should be a little, uh, little um, cautious that it will be the computers which will be doing. And there are going to be questions asked that the, are we going to be really fiddling with the data which has been already created by the AI platforms or we should just simply let the uh, a knowledgeable computer take care of it. But then for a knowledgeable computer to be, to be taking care of it, we also first have to be really learning these techniques. Now, let me be very much a little more specific on the radiomics in the nuclear medicine area, like for example, nuclear medicine applications in radiotherapy or the PET image integrations. To be honest, Right now, just very limited data of nuclear medicine is being utilized in our medical uh, physics applications and radiotherapy applications, other than simply seeing uh, the images. The SUV max, which is basically one point, is something what we just, uh, just get an information, which is not the one, and we discard a lot of other data. And this is not something what we should be doing in future. And that's why it is basically for the extracting the, the tumor volume, we may have to come up with these better platforms or the AI-based integrations. As you can see here, there are these are the these are the, the challenges and these are the methodological issues. And these are the radio, uh, radiomics uh, areas, like starting from the acquisition to the pre-processing to the, uh, the feature extraction, which is basically part of the, the, the machine learning process, to those statistical analysis. And this, of course, also needs to be following the same thing what I talked about, starting from the creating a training data set to the normalization to the dimensionality reduction, then the supervised learning, and then then finally ending with the external validation where we as medical physicists will be playing a role. So this module must be tested on a second set, ideally acquired uh, in an external center with another scanner to be clinically uh, validated. A little more deeper into that, how we will be utilizing it, those images is, a, is the CT, MRI, PET, and we will be creating those physician-based uh, uh, GTVs and putting through these 
our, these uh, algorithms or these uh, our AI models through the radiomic extractions, which can really show you that as if in, in this particular area, in the, the moment we do this radiomic extraction, we find out that there is a high risk area or there is a low risk area where the radiation dose can be reduced. So these are the applications which will get integrated into our planning system, which is basically biological modeling is going to be something which we may be able to follow in the future. So these radiomic target volume, conventional gross tumor volume is segmented by the physician's PET uh, MRI CT images. This steep uh, being time consuming, this step being time consuming, texture analysis can be seen and a useful tool to automatically to determine the radiomic target volume. From this volume, high risk and low risk regions can be identified via machine learning algorithms to allow these paintings in the radiotherapy, uh, radiation therapy area. Another area of importance is the clinical decision support and outcome predictions. And these are the three main areas like, you know, informed decisions and outcome models and predicting the different clinical phenomena will be done through these AI platforms. One of the, 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 the review articles which are, are to come in the medical physics uh, journal in 2017 were three modalities of uh, ultrasound, dynamic uh, uh, and, uh, contrast enhanced MRI along with ma mammography. This is how they, they, they presented how the computer aided design was integrated with a platform of AI and how the, the CNN or the convoluted neural networks was used to really give you a diagnosis of uh, the, uh, the lesions without being the, having the need for the biopsies. And this is something which is actually the future is going to be that many of the invasive procedures will not be uh, required anymore if we are able to use our AI platform in a very systematic manner. This is how the region of interest is being selected. And many of these platforms, medical imaging platforms, will need the help of the medical physicists to create the, the handcrafted free features which needs to be integrated into the system. And that's where we need to be really creating in our inter-institutional and intra-institutional data all of these handcrafted features where we will be playing a role. So coming, continuing with this, this uh, same prediction of the treatment, the precision medicine in tumor, there is a tumor heterogeneity, which we all know. So not all patients respond to the same, uh, uh, to any given therapy, therefore different, different treatments need to be chosen. Just as not all patients respond to the same treatment to a given therapy, not all disease sites within a given patient respond uh, the same way. I think, uh, Dr. Sajiv, uh, am I audible? Everything is clear? Yes, everything is clear, sir. Please. Thank you, thank you. Let me, let me continue. And the, 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 the two things what we just saw is that the heterogeneity is what we were talking is again uh, continued that, you know, not only that the spatial heterogeneity what we're talking, there is also a temporal heterogeneity which needs to be taken care. That means different disease sites have different response to the therapy at a given point of time. Similarly, inside the same patient, the same disease site may respond differently at different points of time. So when, at what point of time the therapy is given is being is being uh, important for the for that's why we need to be knowing about the first line second line and third line chemotherapy regimens which needs to be integrated with our radiation oncology plannings this is an area where medical physicists are right now not playing a very important role but i think in future we will be playing a very important role in integrating this in designing the dose heterogeneity inside the tube and this is actually a, a paper by uh, todd uh, and uh, Stanley, where they, they propose how to do, do this predictive modeling, and this is where, where we need to be playing a, a much important role. Quality assurance, our uh, pet area, and plants are where we need to be focusing more not on the plants which are passing through, but then the plants which are more likely to fail are the ones which need to be really identified much earlier and that this AI platform will be able to do. So the error predictions in the image guidance is something what we should be doing much before even the actual error occurs. And that's where our, uh, these intuitive AI platforms will come. And also another area where the machine time will be, where downtime will be reduced is that we do not need to be doing a quality assurance of the weekend checks or the monthly checks. Many of these 
machine related information on a day to day basis should be collected online and the people sitting at the companies in the uh, in the factories should be able to monitor many of those electronics items and start knowing where the machine down is going to happen and this will definitely lead to a better machine satisfaction dosimetry of course it will reduce the planning time significantly and as i already have told that the, the there will be an overall contraction of the overall staffing this will reduce cost enhance plan quality higher throughput enable frequent adaptive uh, replanning workflow will independently and additional computer uh, based points will, will be happen and continuing with that the radiation uh, dosimetry area will be seeing a lot of changes more than even what actually the imrt did to our field maybe that ai will bring in much bigger changes that's what is being predicted dosimetric duties duties may shift so the present more than the medical physics part business part the actually in our country we are fortunate not to be having a very big distinction between the medical physicist and the junior physicists who do these dosimetric activities but in in the western world uh, uh, the dosimetric positions will be seeing a much bigger change and their uh, roles will shift more towards the treatment plan qa the data availability has to be done in a shared manner and the culture of committed to data sharing is something what we need to also learn and i think open access of data base is something which we need to be proposing and at present we do not have much of those things available to us so equitable access and distribution is something what we should be doing and big data and medicine which is basically already available is something which we need to be also be cautious that this is not something which is already doing but it is only less than 3% of the data which is available so that is basically a very small amount as you can see here in the much bigger medicine medical research projects where even though we have access to the several of these uh, artificial intelligence data mining and big data it is basically this overlapping portion of this deep learning data with this big data which is a very small tiny portion that is what is actually right now going to be giving us many of these answers the pros is that it would be a powerful tool to retrieve the hidden information from the big data but to achieve performance comparable with experienced clinicians but then the cons are that this requires a big data which is not com common in medicine so that means in india we may not have this problem yet because we don't have those kind of restrictions but in in the us and the, in the european countries these data are lying in silos and that's why it is difficult to use those data so lack of intelligence and actually these are most of these studies are directly regression on steroids and it is a black box, box logics so these are the cons of the big data concept now coming to the uh, uh, the 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 bias gets increased as the complexity uh, gets reduced as the complexity increases but then similarly the data variance also increases so there is only an up to an extent we can go and in reduce this bias so that's why there is a, a trough which occurs so we need to be also careful that we just simply adding more data will not help because after a point there is a data fatigue that occurs that's why at this point actually you know after addition of more data may not help because the training and validation sees a saturation the general problems that will occur is that the data set size lateral data heterogeneity the ai model may, model may not work lack of ground truth this is a problem in medicine that medicine still is an art model bias longitudinal data variation and clinical data quality these are uh, the limitations what we need to be really keeping in mind the data curating and data cleaning is also a, a major problem which in the in which in which we, many of the existing data cannot be as it is applied into the ai or machine learning platforms the challenges in deep learning as was being proposed uh in the in our physics uh, journal physica medica is that gaining access to medical archives as i just simply told, uh, told you and obtaining validated and annotated imaging data where we as medical physicists need to be playing a very proactive role, role in creating this validating and annotated many medical data now this uh, the question is that uh, continuing with the same thing the the, the 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 future direction in on the merge of the quantitative imaging and the artificial intelligence in radiation oncology is that the algorithms and the results of the small studies needs to be validated and the challenge related to the standardization of these image acquisition needs to be done where we as physicists will play an important role new data sharing paradigms are required between the institution and even the vendors and for faster development and comprehensive clinical validation and 
to get a better precision and efficiency, this needs to be led by the medical physics community. As I have already told you, we still have a lot of data, but they are all in gyro form. Format. If it has to be integrated, the medical physicist community has to play a good role in cleaning that data and mixing. The best solution may be to go into the data farming where we uh, can create a data. This is, was proposed in 2016 by our physics colleagues, uh, uh, Charles Mayo and uh, uh, Larry, um, uh, uh, Larry Kessler, where they proposed that farming of the data needs to be done, where you know the clinical practice and the knowledge guided things can be done in a four tier basis, starting from the clinical practice of the research tier to the aggregation tier to the interface tier. Just like a agricultural farming, we will be also coming to play in the last two, the interface and the analytic uh, layer. Okay. The last one to talk about is the demographic differences. Asia has 60% of the population and South America has only 5% and North America is something similar to 5%. And the, our Australian colleagues contribute only to less than 1% of the population. The truth is that we use mainly all those validating of these models based on this 5% model either from North America or the 10% model from European models. And we in Asia, we do not have our own models validated with our own data. So the science is universal, but the technology has to be local. If our technology has to be meant for our own patients, we need to be really doing it in our own environment. So it is very important that many of these artificial intelligence needs a local data and needs a local validation. So many of those platforms, like you know what Varian is selling today, uh, this is an AI platform, just bring it. Maybe as a true beam, the machine or the physical machine has, has those potentials, but to do an AI based uh, activity with the recent models that are coming, I will have an hesitation before I validate with our Indian patient data. The best way to predict the future is to create it. And that's why we as medical physicists need to be really getting together in creating the best thing for our future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raj, for the excellent presentation. Actually, your presentation has got a mini data. So it's a, it's a big data that you have provided here. And we have so many questions. And, uh, you know, I have recently come across a machine by name Reflexion in the Stanford University. They are utilizing the biological guidance for uh, treatment uh, planning. So, mm -hmm. do you think uh, such machines which are using the biological guidance planning along with the image guidance planning will take over the radiation therapy in the coming years? Like, uh, you know, the, the data from the nuclear medicine could be utilized and it could be used along with uh, the other big data and radiomics, especially to increase the accuracy and such machines will be the future radiotherapy. It's a very good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Actually, let me take back uh, to these uh, late 90s when uh, our good friend Alan Nahum and uh, Steve Webb, uh, the, those people proposed actually these biological modelings. In fact, I had in uh, Delhi in the year 1998, we had one conference called Optima 98, where optimization of these models are based on biological modeling was something which we had discussed. We have come a long way from there. Many of those tools that were proposed that time uh, have not been able to be utilized in the way the biological planning is to be done. It's just because we didn't have the support of that integration with those data, which just now is emerging. These radiomics based data, like actually, as I showed you, those nuclear medicine images where we are able to have the tumor heterogeneity inside the built into our planning system. Only on the basis of the modeling, those calculations should could, could, could take place. If these are integrated with our images rather than single images on the volumetric image sets, maybe biological modeling and biological planning, that is the dose heterogeneity based treatment planning, will become a normal in the near future. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll go to the questions from the audience. 
and uh, we have mm -hmm. many questions from the audience. And uh, the question is from Dr. How much time we have? We, I have no problem. We can go for 10 more minutes without any difficulty. Okay, all right. Thank you, sir. And uh, we have mm -hmm. the first question uh, from Dr. Aburba Kapsi. And what mm -hmm. about your suggestions for young physicists to prepare themselves to accept such challenges in the near future? Like Dr. Kavasi, it's a very good question. Yeah, especially the employment future or maybe the dosimetrists will be take over in the challenge of treatment planning. QA. Every field, every field undergoes um, a hype, a stabilization freeze, and then there is again a diminishing phase. So every couple of decades, if the field has to sustain these changes, we need to bring in changes in our academic and curriculum to make sure that we are we keep ourselves relevant. And that's what is the demand of the day. I fully agree that uh, the curriculums which were making us more dependent on our quality assurance abilities with the therapy machines, where the physical activity of collecting the radiation therapy data was uh, machine data was something which was keeping us busy, will be taken over by many of these uh, tools which are going to be done, which we used to take for hours will be done in minutes rather we can we can we can say that even it may not even be done by us it will be taken by over by the machines and we will only be utilizing the data that is going to be given to us by the machines so that's why there will be a role change that is occurring so this uh, to be able to be able to keep us relevant we need to be really also making our own um, academic curriculums changed accordingly. We don't have to become data scientists, but we need to be learning medical physics well, where the data science applications will occur. As I just told you that, you know, if your institution is buying a machine, which is an AI based machine, it is just not possible that the data which will be given to you by somebody else can be used. Somebody inside your own organization has to be certifying it. And who is that person? Do, do you think that the clinicians will have the time? or the technologies will have the time, or do they have the acumen to really validate those things? So that is why we need to be really making sure that we as medical physicists have to be really keeping ourselves relevant with these newer modalities, and also reinforcing our uh, contribution by first inculcating it into our training programs, and then putting it in our clinical practice and making yourself relevant. The relevance word is not just simply saying that yeah, I have read about this. The relevance word is that yeah, how much value addition this is going to do in the treatment outcomes. Because being a, a physicist, having come in very close proximity with many of the young as well as senior radiation oncology colleagues, I can only say radiation oncologists respect the physicists for the accuracy they bring into this profession you will be happy to know that radiation oncology is one of the most respected profession inside the radiation, inside the medical fraternity also because of this precision. And we are the people who really make it precise. So I think we need to do these changes in our curriculum. Thank you, sir. Another question from Varadaraj Tanchandra Das. What is the status of EAA in Indian scenario? Are we still can you please repeat it? Uh, what is the status of AI in Indian scenario? And are we still in our back, in the back seat? It's a good question, but uh, I can only say that uh, the question is something, let us not look at it in a pessimistic way. Just being a leader or just being a first uh, introducer doesn't make you uh, something different. Maybe. Somebody else is doing the research, which you don't have to do it. We don't have to be reinventing the wheel. Take the case of uh, the cell phone revolution or the, the telecommunication revolution that India has got. Could you have imagined today the simplicity with which we are able to be having, uh, how many are the attendees now? There must be more than uh, 150 attendees. Uh, what I'm just seeing is that this particular platform what we are using, imagine 15 years back or 10 years back, it would have been a dream. Things like this was not there. 
and this were something these were something which already the west was talking our ability to adapt and our ability to integrate with the speed is something which indians should be proud of and that's where i look at that the indian curriculum needs to be adjusted in such a way that uh, the medical physicists should come out of their present role of just simply number number guys or the the the, 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 the chart calculation guys to the guys who are supposed to be driving the integration of this imaging and the therapy uh, in our platforms and that we are not we are not okay we are little slow but then we are not way behind because even in the west as i told you you see those challenges which we are talking they don't have the data available to them and in india maybe we have an advantage of really maybe over freely available data which is also not being validated in a systematic manner so we need to be really taking our own data and not analyzing them and making the plans much more robust first at institutional level and then at multi institutional level and then at, as a country or mp as an association can play a big role in creating an ai based uh, um, um, data validation uh, platform in, in collaboration with our radiation oncology colleagues from aroi we can have a joint uh, uh, platform which can become the document for the government to follow for the therapy and the imaging applications so i think let us take the lead thank you sir uh, another question it's a kind of repetition from parthiv and vinay europe is physicists are going to lose job i can uh, tell you one thing this question was something which was asked to me like you know because the cars are becoming automated cars and now nobody will be driving and nobody will be everybody will be sitting in the back seat let us take uh, the case of uh, pilots uh, in the mid 90s auto pilot uh, programs were started in the aircrafts in the last 30 years has the pilot training anyway become lesser or the number of pilots have become less in fact rather people, more and more people are flying in autopilot planes and the pilots are getting much more money of course this pandemic has exposed them in a very different manner but the pilots are the highly paid uh, professionals so that is why that is why i am saying if we are scared of losing our jobs actually that should be taken with a positive stride we need to be really training more than what our routine medical physics trainings are and we have to be contributing little more but our jobs are not going to be going away and you see this is the same example actually you know in the in the in the australian perth conference somebody asked me the question when i had to answer that in india when in the 80s the uh, railway counters were getting their computers for printing tickets and giving it instead of those manual tickets there was a strike and people thought that the computers will take away jobs of the people who are really working for years together giving only manual tickets but today if you see those people have not lost their jobs even railways continue to be employing many more people so the job natures have changed but the jobs have not reduced and that is why physicists also have to adapt to the newer platforms and that's why there will be no job loss <laughs> thank you sir and uh, the same for the, the same participant has another question how physicists should adapt to the new development yeah actually i think you know my generation is supposed to be more worried about this question than the younger generation because adaptability reduces a little bit with age but if i am embracing it this with this confidence i think my youngsters should, young ever friend should be able to do it with much easier uh, uh, acceptance of course we need at uh, different forums i can only say that actually you know two days uh, back i got a link from dr rehani where even uh, two 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 good uh, iomp talks were there on artificial intelligence uh, uh, being uh, given uh, the, the reason why i just brought the topic is that we need to be really creating many more educational platforms in our own community and i think initiatives like what dr thomas has taken is something which is always welcome and we need to be really meeting more often in uh, reducing this perception of threat 
and sharing many of these uh, good things what we as a community can do it and i can i'm sure that we have the potency to make our profession even more stronger and you know the medical uh, equipment vendors today will be dependent more on us than their age old techniques of electronics their electronics needs data and that's where we as individuals will play a bigger role and we medical physicists we are in clinics and that's where we will be really giving them a credible data you know this opportunity till now the regulatory authorities have been only insisting on just copy pasting those uh, 0.1 mm 0.1% or 1% those variations or those accuracies are being talked about but the moment these kind of validations will come it will totally take away those machine validations and all are not going to be a headache for us those will be documented automatically the patient data the clinical data will become our strength so that's where regulatory changes also will come and maybe if any of our friends from the regulatory authorities are here in this platform i will uh, request them to take this message across to the regulators also that uh, the physicist's role itself is going to change so instead of just asking us for just a chart signing or uh, dose calculation those calculations will still be there those measurements will still be there but then those measurements are not going to be done by us in a physical or manual manner all those activities will be done online and we only will have to be validating them and cross checking them thank you sir and another question from uh, dinesh saroj will too mm -hmm. much rely on automation lead to reduction of human thinking efficiency and judgment power uh, actually i wish this would have been true i used to think of these things these same question in my childhood we are all much smarter than our parents but uh, it didn't happen my children are much smarter than me and that is why if we are thinking that ki machines will overtake us i will only say that ki i think this is not going to happen okay those uh, stephen hawkins uh, slide is something that uh, what you are looking at it is but i will only say that ki human race uh, has a infinite uh, absorbing capacity and uh, intelligence is something which uh, the machines uh, going to be taking over us intelligent machines it is going to be a long way 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 uh, much longer yes there are destructive forces which can use these things against the human race only but then that's not something that's only a very small percentage it will all be for the good and uh, machines will not take over us okay and uh, there is one more question from ajay shukla there is ajay uh, the ai application already applied to just x-ray images to identify common commonly uh, encountered diseases what about its application in covid 19 screening yeah this covid thing is something which i know that it is a good question actually it is i wish i had answer to that the reason why we are right now not having many answers in this particular imaging of this covid uh, data is something because the history is so short and the image itself uh, the disease itself is changing so fast we do not have the credible data to be integrating and uh, telling us that the, the 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 images are reliable enough sources to give us any prediction of the covid many of the covid uh, infections which are imaged are basically on terminally ill patients and early stage infections being imaged and utilized in preventing uh, those things are still not available and uh, i will say that ki we have to be a little bit uh, uh, patient in um, collecting more data and processing it because ai tools in uh, covid management especially in imaging data is not available thank you sir and the last question from the audience uh, may not know the last question uh, from pit my kame and uh, will it uh, what's the, the question is okay okay whether how far 
how far this growth of ai will further divide the ever growing differences of rich and the poor global differences of rich and poor <laughs> yeah so i had a, i had a slide i had a slide on that actually uh, in last uh, november uh, in uh, nature there was a paper on uh, editorial on the access of artificial intelligence in oncology in fact uh, the prediction by the editor was that even though ai tools will come the tools will make this divide even more pronounced or wider because the genomic data what is required is available only to a very few percentage of the people and this rich and poor divide will something which will make it even wider that is what was the prediction and i will only say that ki it is happening with all technologies technologies do come and they do have a role to play but then the accessibility is not getting better maybe it needs disruption the disruption what telecommunication did in um, bringing the cell phones to a rickshaw wala or to our bikes is something which we as physicists should be doing it in making ai bridge this this gap so that a person sitting in one of the very remote places with just a single phone should be able to get access to this kind of high end image processing data you know only on the basis of the voice the hoarseness of the voice we should be able to detect disease can you imagine the kind of artificial intelligence what we are talking of the earlier question was something much similar related to this how to diagnose the covid case if that can happen in oncology we have a much longer time span to diagnose and reach the patients if we can downstage the disease in the remote places with this ai tools we will be doing a big service to the community and that's where medical physicists will play a big role the present clinicians do not have the time to go to the villages or go to the remote areas we as physicists can be the link and let us do this exercise and i take this as a challenge that this question is a very appropriate question okay thank, thank you very, very much sir. thank you very much and another question maybe the last one from manasa km who will have control yeah. and access to individual patient data uh this is a good question who will have uh, who will have access to individual patient data yeah who will have control control over the data the it is country specific and uh, in the us it is basically the institutions are responsible for that and in our country we are actually talking of institutions definitely do have a responsibility but even inside our own institutions we don't share data one doctor doesn't share it with another doctor and uh, if uh, sometimes it may sound very paradoxical that india is a very open country for everything but actually it is rather reverse we don't share amongst our own colleagues so that is um, it's it's a, it's, a, it's not a note to really be proud of but then we can use or just suppose the whole thing we can have a, a, a repository of this thing anonymous data and actually with these new um, uh, platforms that uh, uh, the government is planning on this digital health we will be able to get access to many more data and uh, this question is a regulatory question we have to uh, wait and have uh, a, a clear answer on that but then for these answers to be utilized we should first have the tools the ai tools if they work why not uh, get access to those uh, patients data which are basically not no patient would like to be stop to be stopping his data being utilized uh, like actually uh, even a dead person gives his organs so why a person who is really already having a disease will not give his data which can be utilized by uh, the other people to cure a, a, a disease so i think this is something like the organ donation bank we need to be talk uh, creating a, a data depository also for the purpose of uh, creating artificial intelligence tools Okay. Thank you, sir. This is the last question, last from my side. So mm -hmm. you talked about the external validation for the AI algorithms or AI systems, but if it comes to medical physics, do you need uh, more costly equipments? I, I just missed a little bit of the question. Can you repeat it? Uh, when it comes to the external validation of the systems, do we require 
do we require more complex testing devices? No, actually, see, the, the first you try to understand what exactly we are meaning about external val that validation. The same procedure is to be carried out with an external data set. So the algorithm remains the same. And if the data is if that external data set also shows the same results, you see, it is validation of your results. If an AI model is able to detect in a disease or take out a volume or downstairs a disease or create a, a, a data set like I showed you in the nuclear medicine uh, picture, uh, a, a heterogeneity inside the tumor volume, if a data set is able to use it, see it, the same thing external validation means take a similar amount of data from another institution, similar data, and then validate it that it is working there. So this doesn't require any extra equipment. It is basically utilize the when I meant validation of the data, validation of another set of data from another institution with this model. Thank you very much. And so we have uh, completed all the questions. I think let us, let us, let us, I think let us give the, 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 the our friends a break because I think they have. Uh, already been there, been here for quite long. Hope, uh, hope, hope I, I could uh, um, uh, give some insights into our uh, field of uh, medical physics uh, in the era of uh, artificial intelligence. It's not some, it's a big data that you have given to all of us, all the participants are greatly benefited. And uh, my apologies for the technical error that we had in the beginning of the conference. We were unable to run the program because of some technical problems with our uh, application and the software systems. And I apologize for the technical delay in uh, opening the program. As you all know, this campaign has been grown to all the major continents with uh, hundreds of participants for almost all the party, all the webinars. And there have been thousands of professionals from Asia, Oceania, Africa, Europe, and United States of America has attended these webinars. If any of you wish to donate any PPE for any health workers or teams, please let us know by email, website, or social media. And while you will be sending us the feedback, or after the webinar, or it may be a surgical mask, or maybe a PPE, anything, it's up to you. So we will update all the details of the sponsor and the donor in our website. So. We know that we are a very small group of medical physics in the large group among the group of uh, healthcare, large healthcare workers. So please use the review forms to review us in, in the application link. And uh, today I especially thank Dr. Rath once again for supporting this campaign by volunteering this lecture, by sharing your expert knowledge. So please join the forum, which is created in the Ongoray's website that will be able to receive more updates on the future of webinars and other details. I thank all participants for your active participation and welcome you all for the future webinars. See you again. Thank you. Thank you very much.